Hello there, and welcome to class. Actually, welcome to my home. And uh, I hope that, honestly, I hope that this is gonna be a, a uniquely beneficial experience for you. It's not gonna be the same as sitting in the, the auditorium there in the JKB on the campus at Brigham Young University. I hope, here's my, here's my desire, is that it will feel to you like, like you're sitting right across the table from me in my home as we talk about some things that really matter and things that I feel are very, very relevant to you and to today. So be patient with us as we try out this new format for classes. There will be potentially some struggles along the way, uh, some hiccups, but we're going to do the best we can to make this a great experience. Just know that we're going to have to modify some things on the syllabus, on the schedule, between here and the end of the semester. I sent you an email that describes some of the uh, assignment changes to make it more adaptable. And I would just remind you that uh, the final exam is still going to take place. It'll just be from your home uh, using learning suites. So anything written in your scriptures, the hard copy of your scriptures, is still fair game. So keep all those practices and, and, and uh, things in place as we move forward. Uh, I'm filming this tonight in, uh, in my room on the 18th of March. This morning, there was an earthquake here in Utah. Those of you who are still here probably felt it if you're living somewhere along the Wasatch Front. And the stock markets have been going crazy lately. The, the closures of restaurants and all sports and all meetings and all art opportunities and everything's just kind of shutting down as everybody's hunkering down. These are interesting times, and I know that some of you are probably feeling a little bit nervous and maybe panicked in some cases, feeling isolated. I would just remind you of something that Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And on another occasion, shortly before that one, in the upper room, uh, moments before going into Gethsemane, he told his apostles, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Uh, that's a pretty good, pretty good promise to realize that uh, Jesus, right before he goes into Gethsemane, he's telling his apostles, don't, don't be troubled. Don't, don't let the things that are going on around you cause you to be afraid and feel like, like I'm not in charge. I, I still am in charge and things are going to turn out okay. So I hope that you will retain that as we move forward. And if you need to reach out, if you're struggling, just send an email. We'll, we'll figure out a way to connect. We can do a video chat with a couple of you if needed as well. So just reach out and, and try to help each other out as well in the digital dialogue uh, discussion forum. forum. Uh, be, be kind and be compassionate and uh, try to help each other. Uh, as we begin today, we're going to finish off the war chapters, finish off the Book of Alma. There are some really, really powerful lessons for us to cover. I will meet you in Alma chapter 51. And as you turn to Alma 51, uh, we're going to set the stage by going here. Um, I want you to see this. You can get this map once again if you go to virtualscriptures.org and click on the Book of Mormon map. Then you can download this HD, this high definition version, and uh, use it. You can print it out, you can use it on screens or however you want. Let me give you the lay of the land. What's happened is uh, Amalekiah sent his army up here to Ammonihah. You'll remember that was the worst battle in the history of the Book of Mormon, chapter 49, verse 23, where not a single Nephite was killed, but over a thousand Lamanites died. And they came home, and Amalekiah was really angry at them. And he got, his, <clears throat> got the Lamanite armies ready to go again. In the meantime, the king men 
rise up in power here in Zarahemla and they start a civil war. So Captain Moroni, who has spent all this time and energy fortifying all these cities, now has to pull the people out of those cities and bring them into the center of the land to fight this, this internal war, this civil war. So Amalekiah comes in and he takes out Moroni. And this is where he begins the wars for Moroni. Now watch chapter 51, Alma 51, verse 26. I'll read it. You, you go ahead and just look at the map and follow along as I read this. Thus he went on, taking possession of many cities, the city of Nephiha, the city of Lehi, and the city of Morianton, and the city of Omner, and the city of Gid, and the city of Mulek, all of which were on the east borders by the seashore. This is rough. We've just lost our entire seashore, our, our coastline on the, the right-hand side of the map here. Jershon was the place where the anti-Nephi-Lehite group had, had lived for many years until Alma 35, they've relocated them over to the city and the land of Melek. So we have now lost all of these cities and it's not just that they were cities, they were fortified cities. Huh. I wonder if that has anything to do with us today. I wonder if there are times where, where we develop strengths, where we put a lot of energy and effort and make something really strong. And then if we're not careful and it gets turned for the wrong purposes, our, our strengths can actually become weaknesses. And uh, that's exactly what's happening here for these Nephites in this land. So what you're going to watch is that um, Amalekiah made it all the way up here to Mulek before Captain Moroni sends Tiancum to head him off because we can't lose Bountiful. That would have been tragic. And so he heads him off, and that night he's camped on the seashore while uh, Tiancum is camped in the borders of the land Bountiful. And it's that evening when Tiancum leaves, goes down to the seashore somewhere here, and he finds the tent of Amalekiah, throws a javelin into his heart, killing him. And you'll notice in chapter uh, 51, verse 33, it says that they were all sleeping on the, the seashore, the, the beach, basically, because sleep had overpowered them because of their much fatigue, which was caused by the labors and heat of the day. Huh. I wonder what time of the year that was that they were fighting this battle. Notice chapter 52, verse 1. It came to pass in the 20 and 60th year of the reign of the judges over the people of Nephi. Behold, when the Lamanites awoke on the first morning of the first month. Huh. Happy New Year's, Lamanites. You come in and you see your, your king with a javelin sticking out of, out of his body. He's dead. That's not a good way to start your year. In antiquity, kings would often begin their year parading in front of the people to show their power and their prowess and their prosperity. This is going to be a good year. Well, it doesn't, doesn't quite work that way for these people in this particular instance. So, Happy New Year. By the way, that would not have been January 1st because they're not using the Gregorian calendar like us. They're using their own calendar system. Uh, and it must have been hot that time of the year. Uh, wherever, whenever that happened. In fact, everything in the Book of Mormon seems to be a little warmer than we're used to in in uh, winter time in the north. There's no mention of any of those kinds of elements in the book. It's it's all heat and hot. In chapter fifty one, we've lost all of these cities. Captain Moroni then shows you, here's a pattern. Instead of giving up, instead of throwing your hands in the air saying, this, this is horrible, we're, we surrender, you'll notice he focuses on one thing at a time. How do I get Mulek? And in chapter 50, 52, he's able to take the city of Mulek. And then he's going to focus his efforts on Gid. And then after that, on Omner. I think that's a pretty good pattern for you and me to follow in our own life when we have struggles that have gotten into our soul, whether they be sins or addictions or bad behaviors or things that are just not helpful. 
that are that are going to lead us to destruction. We focus on one thing at a time, taking them out in order. It's a pretty pretty profound pattern for us to follow. In chapter 53, if you turn over there, you're going to notice that we focus now on what's going on in the other part of the battle. So we have the stripling warriors who were living here in Melek with their families. Keep in mind, their, their fathers buried their weapons of war, their, their fathers, grandfathers, uncles, cousins, they buried their weapons of war down here somewhere near the land of Ishmael 13 years previous to this. So that means many of these boys were raised in homes without a father because over a thousand men were killed here. So many of them were raised in single parent homes. Uh, and the fathers who did survive and grandfathers and uncles who did survive, they're not picking up swords to teach these young boys how to fight because, well, they were, it seems, addicted to killing. I love the fact that this Book of Mormon written for our day, Mormon looking down the quarter of time at us, he saw, he, he had to have seen addiction. And he tells us a pretty profound story about what a, a particular group of people did with their addiction. He uses words, let, let me talk about their addiction. He uses words like they were a bloodthirsty and a ferocious people who delighted in the shedding of blood. Sounds a, sounds a little bit like they're addicted to killing and to, to, to this violent warfare. And once they become converted, they say, I, I don't want to go back to the way I was before. I don't want to love killing the way I did before. So what did they do? They buried their weapons deep in the earth back there in Alma 24. Now that all happened 13 years ago. So you have this group of boys now here in Melek who didn't make that promise. They, they haven't covenanted not to fight. And so they step forward in chapter 53 and they say, we want to fight. Look at, uh, let, let's go here to Alma 53. And look at a couple of verses together. Look at verse 17. They entered into a covenant to fight for the liberty of the Nephites, yea, to protect the land unto the laying down of their lives. Yea, even they covenanted that they would never give up their liberty, but they would fight in all cases to protect the Nephites and themselves from bondage. Look at these other descriptors. Verse 20, they were all young men. They were exceedingly valiant for courage and for strength and for activity. But this is not all. They were men who were true at all times in whatsoever thing they were entrusted. I wonder if that would be a good description of the rising generation today. That God raises up a generation to say, can you not only be be valiant for courage and for strength and for activity, but also people who can be true at all times in whatsoever thing they were entrusted. Verse 21, they were men of truth and soberness, for they had been taught to keep the commandments of God and to walk uprightly before him. I love it. It's beautiful. As this sets the stage for this battle, so they, they, they've signed up. They're going to go fight. And uh, the problem is they've, they've never fought before. And we're skipping over a couple of those chapters there where Amaron and Captain Moroni exchange letters. And uh, those are some pretty uh, powerful letters back and forth. Chapter 55, we're going to take the city of Gid. And now we get into 56. Let me go back here. 56 sets the stage beautifully. If you look at verse 14. So the Lamanites have obtained possession of the city in the lands of Manti, city of Zeezrom, Cumani, and Antipara. So here's the struggle. Picture this. You have the, the stripling warriors who have come down here. They're positioned in the land or in the city of Judea. And it's their job to protect, protect Minan and Zarahemla to the north, the, the heart, the center of the land. And so we've got 2,000 young men who have never fought before. And we've got an army of 10,000 men that uh, are under the direction of Antipas. The problem is 
they're not getting new recruits, whereas the Lamanites are being reinforced in these four cities almost daily. And it doesn't take a genius to figure out that it's only a matter of time before we're not going to be able to hold back this tide and protect the, the heart of the land. These young men recognize that and they say, we got to do something. So they come up with a strategy. The stripling warriors are going to come down and they're going to run past the city of Antipara as if they're going out to the city that's by the sea. We don't know the name of that city, so I just called it City by the Sea. Probably resort town out there. We don't know. So we're going to run by this large army in the city of Antipara. They're going to see us and they're going to say, hey, we can get them. So they're going to clear out the city and chase us, at which point Antipas is going to bring in his large army, take over the guards that are left. Now we have one city back in our hands, leave enough men there to protect the city, and then follow to, to help us uh, fight this army of the, the Lamanites as needed. So the plan is, uh, is laid out, and they carry it forth perfectly. They march by, the, the Lamanites come out, and Antipas comes in, takes the city. The rest of his men follow, and it says when they're, they're being chased, they turn northward. So now it's just a foot race. You have the striplings, you have the Lamanites, and you have the army of Antipas. Three groups, all just in a foot race running north. They camp that night. And the next morning when they wake up, they look and hear the Lamanites coming. So we run again. And so the three groups run an entire day of, of trying to, to stay ahead of this group. And they camp again that night. We know distance-wise that it took Elma three days to, to get from Melek to Ammonihah back in Elma chapter 8. And so for these guys who are now running two full days, they're probably getting fairly close to Ammonihah. And they camp that night, and the third morning they wake up and they're being chased, so they run away. And now, partway through the morning, this is where the story gets really interesting. Because they realize they're not being chased anymore. And Helaman says, uh, we have a decision to make. You can turn back, but if you turn back, it's possible that that Lamanite army is now uh, hiding, waiting for you to come back so they can trap you and kill you in ambush. Or option number two, perhaps the army of Antipas has caught up with them and they're now engaged in a battle. And if that's the case, do you want to go back and fight? Look at this. We are so close. We could just very easily keep running to safety. But these boys realize that there are some things that are more important than life itself. There are some things basically worth, worth dying for. And the liberty of their families and of this nation is what they're going to fight for. And they're willing to put their life on the line. Some of the most powerful verses of scripture uh, for standing up in a fight are found here in chapter 56. You can pick it up with me in verse 44. There at this moment of decision, this crossroads. Therefore, what say ye, my sons? Will ye go against them to battle? And now I say unto you, my beloved brother Moroni, that never had I seen so great courage, nay, not amongst all the Nephites. I love that coming from Helaman, one of these great Nephite prophets, saying, I can't find this kind of faith among all the Nephites that these Lamanite young men have. It's amazing to him. Uh, look at verse 46. For as I had ever called them my sons, for they were all of them very young. Do you like that? A Nephite leader calling these Lamanite boys my sons. I think there's, there's a lot to like in that from my perspective. He's not looking at their nationality. He's not looking at their race. He's not looking at what makes them different. He's saying, you're my, you're my sons. And look how they respond. Oh, by the way, he said there in verse 46, for they were all of them very young. Even so, they said unto me, Father, 
So they refer to him as Father. Behold, our God is with us, and he will not suffer that we should fall. Then let us go forth. We would not slay our brethren if they would let us alone. One of the things I love about the scriptures is, on occasion, the things that they don't say, not just the things that they do say. In this case, the word slay is not what most people would have expected these boys to say. We would have expected them to say something like, Heoman, we would not go back and fight those Lamanites if they would just leave us alone. But they didn't say that. They said, we would not slay our brethren. These are, these are, you know, distant relatives. These are Lamanites. And we don't intend to go back and fight with them. We intend to go back and slay them. That's a pretty bold statement. Especially bold when considering verse 47. Now they never had fought. Yet they did not fear death. And they did think more upon the liberty of their fathers than they did upon their lives. Yea, they had been taught by their mothers that if they did not doubt, God would deliver them. I don't think they're looking at their arms saying, we're so strong, or their sword saying, we're so much better at sword fighting and, and at, at winning a battle than the Lamanites that are seasoned killing machines. These are veteran warriors. I don't think they're looking at any of those things. I think they're looking up saying, our God is going to deliver us. That's what our moms taught us. And we, we do not doubt that our mothers knew it. Verse 48. Uh, I want to I share a brief experience that uh, Elder Neil A. Maxwell recorded in a, in a film series called Saints at War. Elder Maxwell fought in World War II in the Pacific Theater. And he and his, uh, his men were on an island out there in the Pacific, and they had taken a fairly high position on this island. And the enemy had a couple of locations where they, they had some capacity to fire mortar shells up onto where the Elder Maxwell and his group of men were, were hunkered down. And so the first shot would be way off, but they could make adjustments. And by triangulating their calculations, they could get closer and closer and closer until they could destroy this, this whole group of men up there in this position. Elder Maxwell said that the mortar shells hit closer and closer and closer until one of them landed just outside of their camp at which point all of them kind of knew, all right, this is the end. They know where, they, they, they've calibrated their, their shells to the point where now they're just gonna kill us all. And he said they all hunkered down in their, in their foxholes and waited basically for the end to come. But they were shocked when nothing really happened. It was all silent at that point. And they couldn't figure out why. It was years later, after the war had ended, when Elder Maxwell was home and his aunt pulled him aside and said, Neil, did your mother ever tell you about that experience she had when you were off at the war? And he didn't know what she was talking about. And so she, sh she shared with him that on one particular night, his mother and father had gotten into bed, said their prayers, and were, were going to sleep when all of a sudden his mother sat bolt upright in bed and reached over and said, Clarence, Neil is in grave danger. We have to pray for him now. And she said, your, your mother and father got out of bed, and your dear mother poured her heart out to God in behalf of you, because she knew something was, uh, something was terribly wrong. Elder Maxwell, with tears in his eyes at that point in the video, said, I did not doubt that my mother knew it. Now, look at this. We have a battle that's going to be waged on that particular day. These boys are going to go back, and they're going to find out that Antipas caught up with the Lamanites, and they've been having a terrible battle, and Antipas is, is dead. 
and many of his men have, have been wounded and others killed and they're not doing well. And these 2,000 young men who have never fought before are going to come into that battle from the rear. It's going to be somewhere in this general vicinity. We're just over the, the wilderness from Melek. Um, I, I don't have any, any authority to, to say what the mothers were doing in Melek that morning. But there's something in the back of my mind that tells me that they weren't just having a quilting bee or having a Relief Society social of some sort that mor morning. I think, I think there were a lot of mothers who sensed that their boys were in grave danger and that they're pouring their heart out to God in behalf of those sons, that he would preserve them in that battle. I don't think for a minute that those boys went into that battle alone. They went in armed with a shield of faith that was crafted by their mothers at home and that is now being strengthened in that very moment of battle by their mothers at home. I don't believe that those boys went in without some divine help from their fathers as well, those who had, who had given their life 13 years before. They were, they were expert fighters, and we have lots of stories in the Bible where God allows people from the other side of the veil to help with physical battles on this side of the veil, the, the veil. And I think those boys' arms and, and their capacities were strengthened far beyond, far beyond their own physical capacity to be able to uh, engage in such a battle. Notice verse 56. Uh, actually, you, you've got a whole bunch of people who died that were men in Antipas's army, but look at verse 56. But behold, to my great joy, there had not one soul of these stripling warriors that had fallen to the earth. Yea, they had fought as if with the strength of God. Yea, never were men known to have fought with such miraculous strength and with such mighty power did they fall upon the Lamanites that they did frighten them. And for this cause did the Lamanites deliver themselves up as prisoners of war. My dear friends, I, I, I admire you. I respect you for the battles that are being waged in, in your life right now. And for the uncertainties and the struggles and the trials and the temptations that you face. I hope that you'll be able to see yourself in this story and in, in subsequent stories that come. Turn the page over, chapter 57. They have another battle. And in this, we, we lose over a thousand men, Nephite warriors. Over a thousand of them die in this battle here in chapter 57. But look at verse uh, 25. It came to pass that there were 200 out of my 2,060, because we've added 60 uh, young men, even younger, to the ranks earlier on in this chapter. So there were 200 out of my 2,060 who had fainted because of the loss of blood. Nevertheless, according to the goodness of God and to our great astonishment and also the joy of our whole army, there was not one soul of them who did perish. Yea, and neither was there one soul among them who had not received many wounds. I wonder if there's incredible application to our day and to the battles that you're fighting. It's a war. You are engaged in a very real war, and there will be injuries. There will be struggles. There will be people spiritually dying around us. Uh, but the point is, verse 27, now this was the faith of these of whom I have spoken. They are young and their minds are firm, and they do put their trust in God continually. I hope that today, as we've had this opportunity to spend this time together, even though it's been virtual class, that you've sensed more fully 
the reality that God is in his heavens. You are not forsaken. Uh, he knows what he's doing. You have parents, especially mothers, who know when you're struggling. And even if you don't have a parent on this side of the veil, or if you have a parent on this side of the veil who maybe isn't as tuned in to those kinds of things, God has compensatory blessings. There are people who are aware of you on both sides of the veil, who are fighting for you and with you, so that as you engage in these struggles and in these wrestles moving forward, you will win the war. We may lose a couple of battles here and there. We may lose some ground here and there, but you keep fighting. You keep moving forward. You will overcome. Your future is so bright. These are the best of times. There was never, ever a better time to be alive than right now on, in the history of the world if we will use the resources like the handbook that God has provided for us to win those battles that we are waging today. I hope you know that you are loved. And may the Lord bless you as you move forward in faith. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I hope you'll have a great weekend. And I look forward to spending time with you again next week. Have a good one.